Dissatisfaction. What is the first thing you think of when you hear the word? I work in data science, kind of. So the only reasonable way for me to find out what people think is by doing some quantitative and qualitative research. By that, I mean harassing strangers and friends on social media and doing some random polling, asking them one simple question. Thematic analysis shows three broad categories and feelings being the biggest one. We see a lot of negative feelings, disappointment, unhappy, frustration, regret, unsurprising. I also did a simple sentiment analysis by sampling around 80, 10,000 tweets using a very simple query. And again, unsurprisingly, the majority is negative. Some of you might even wonder, hmm, I would have expected more. Surely this satisfaction is negative. But what if I tell you it is not necessarily the case? What if I tell you it is part of our origin? Some might even say that it is designed in our biology to protect us, and it can be great. I'm not an anthropologist. My name is Cynthia. And I'm what they call a generalist, because I have many hats on. I work for multilateral organizations on data science, health communications, and digital health while pursuing my medical degree. People who know me know that I've always been weirdly passionate about working. Ever since I was little, I had always struggled with many interests. In my final year of high school, I was a student representative, a choir member, an animal rescue volunteer, a pianist working on my piano ATCR diploma, and voluntarily a researcher. The year before, I was already looking into a chemical reaction called photocatalysis, and I was fascinated by it. So I was basically extremely Asian and shockingly type A. So of course, the following year, I had to make a photocatalytic water purification device, and at least that was the plan. So I was hoping to use the school laboratory for some experiments, and I wasn't expecting much of a pushback, because choir members and sports teams, they hung out after school to practice. But in my case, it didn't go so well. It was rejection after rejection. One time, my teacher straight up called me selfish, for I was asking for resources that none of my peers had, while in fact, none of them had asked for them. I didn't give up, Mom, I didn't raise a quitter, so I resorted to seeking help from the very nice lab technicians. They found out, weren't very happy about it, and they called me out of English class once, and they went, Cynthia, oh Cynthia, why can't you stop? Why do you have to keep pushing it? Why can't you be grateful for the other opportunities that you already have? Why can't you be a little bit more patient and wait until you need to work on your little science project? I was shattered. I really meant no harm. I mean, I was a huge nerd. What harm can a huge nerd do? I only want to do some science. I was ready to cover some additional costs, and I had all these logistical arrangements sorted out, hoping to convince them. But no and no. Rejected, I just stood speechless and cried. And I hated myself for crying. There is this anger, frustration, disappointment firing up in my heart. But despite not fully understanding why I felt so strongly about something I didn't know whether it would work, the 17-year-old me was very stubborn. What do you do when you have no lab? You build your own lab. So I went home, I went on some shady websites, and I bought a ton of chemicals and equipments home. Not advice to children. Um, and I built my little humble lab and went straight to work. I stayed up late, co emailed dozens of profs and researchers. I took long bus rides to visit them, learned some chemistry that was beyond my level, all because I had this huge dissatisfaction. During the moments people told me to give up, the moments some of my experiments flopped, the moments I questioned myself, what the heck am I doing? And maybe it wouldn't be that fruitful after all. Maybe it would fail, so would the other things I tried to do. Maybe what I investigated the previous year wouldn't translate well into anything useful. But I, Cynthia Lam, needed to find out regardless. It wasn't until years later I found exact words to describe my feelings when I encountered a quote by the ballet legend Martha Graham. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. There is only a queer divine dissatisfaction a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. 
I finally understood why I was content but dissatisfied, restless but not tired, blessed and rest. The idea I wasn't able to articulate when I was 17. There was this raw energy fueling me to go ahead. It, it is human nature. When I think about it, if humans were completely satisfied with just seeing in a day and not seeing in a dark, we wouldn't have had fire. And if we were completely satisfied with just fire, we wouldn't have had light bulbs. And if I may, I'm going to ask you in this very moment, are you satisfied? And I'm going to take a wild bet that you're not. We can be dissatisfied with many different things, the state of life, the state of the world, or simply longing for more stimulation and entertainment. Regardless, there is no satisfaction because if humans were completely satisfied thousands of years ago or even yesterday, the reality that we live in today would not exist. Dissatisfaction makes us human. Dr. Raphael Yuba, a psychiatrist, even argues satisfaction is discouraged by nature because it will lower our guard against possible threats like dismemberment and starvation. Jerome Barkov, anthropologist, even said, you wouldn't be alert, you wouldn't be competitive. You need to be dissatisfied to survive. Dissatisfaction, postulating humans as dissatisfied animals might seem kind of depressing. On the contrary, I find it so amazing. It's essentially comforting. Dissatisfaction is not a personal failure. It is our nature. Embracing this has led to several radical changes in my life. The first change, I accept my desire to grow. Even when I was a little girl, I had always been questioned whether I was chasing and hustling for the sake of it. And as someone who has always identified myself as grateful, I was especially challenged. My people-pleasing self also didn't want to be seen as aggressive. But let's examine this satisfaction. Why do we think it is innately bad? When we think about taking a break from work to recharge and procrastination, they both involve not working, but what we deem the two equivalent. We tend to confuse ambition with aggression, greed with dissatisfaction. Think about the last time you worked really hard for an exam a grant, a job, a scholarship. Did you want to hide it from others? Are we all familiar with the phrase called, I didn't really study that hard. It is all over subtle Asian traits and we like to pretend we've only heard it from others as if we've never said it ourselves. Admit it, we've all said it, or at least 90% of us. We're brought up in a culture that tells us to hide our edge. It is a weird culture that looks down on both people who don't try hard enough and those we think are trying too hard. It is not helpful. We're giving very confusing labels and we're essentially normalizing aggression with ambition by deeming the two equivalent. Perhaps both greed and the desire to grow are two sides of the same coin. They both stem from the same origin of dissatisfaction. But it is up to us to decide what to do with it. So it is time for us to stop giving labels to others, to ourselves, and instead embrace we can be ambitious and generous, dissatisfied because there's more we can be and more we can give. Second change, it humbles me to work harder. It sounded as if I had the silver bullets I would be working nonstop. The reality is I am only human and I'm a human extremely gifted at procrastination. It is a gift channel in different avenues. For example, I'm very, very talented at binging shows. Like one season a day, easy. Three seasons, also not a problem. And then I took a look at Mother Graham, the first dancer to perform at the White House and to receive the highest civilian award. I'm no dancer, but I've always admired ballerinas. The beautiful moves, the graceful confidence, and they're disgusting tolls. My ballerina friends told me they take pride in how disgusting their tolls can get. They even hold contests between studios comparing who's got the ugliest tolls. Martha Graham is a ballet legend, the ballet legend. And yet she humbly acknowledges there is no satisfaction 
only more room to grow, more tools to break. Seeing that humbles me to work harder, learn more, and be better at whatever I'm doing. You might then wonder, if you keep comparing yourself to a legend like that, isn't that scary? Isn't that tiring? 100%. Sometimes the fear gets so extreme, it counteracts the desire to get better. And that's when I take a deep breath, revisit the quotes, and recognize, yes, bless and rest is about striving for better, but it is also about accepting there is no satisfaction. So here comes the third change. I understand the unrest Martha Graham describes is blessed because she's not being distressed by it. She's having peace with it. It is liberating. It gave me, gave the 17 year old me the courage to go email professors and researchers, despite having thought of 1,000 reasons why they wouldn't bother replying to a 17 year old nerd. It dared me to innovate, despite not having ducked into every single textbook and article about photocatalysis. It gave me the strength to hit that submit button to send my research to Google Science Fair, despite chickening out quite a bit after seeing past winning projects on algorithms to diagnose breast cancer and design new flu medications. I accepted I was probably not there yet. But who cares? Who has ever defined there? We have this imaginary definition of perfection, but history tells us progress in humanity is made by challenging the status quo and rejecting complacency, even when it just comes from within. End of story. I built H2 Pro, a photocatalytic water purification device. Out of thousands of entries from 150 countries, I was selected by Google and I went to, I was, I represented Australia at Google Science Fair 2014 and I've got flown to Silicon Valley to talk about my project to renowned scientists and engineers. It was featured in media, I got flown to more places to talk more about it. Now that sounds like the high point of the story, the climax. But what if I told you that was a failure? Six years ago, after Google and high school, I couldn't find the funding to continue my research. And eventually, if I'm being honest, I just let med school get in the way and I stopped pursuing it. Sometimes I wonder, do I deserve the recognition if at the end of the day, I fail to bring the project forward? Do I have what it takes to be a scientist, an innovator? See, despite having experienced blessed and rest, I still forget about it sometimes. I get distracted by imposter syndrome, failure, stress, comparison. H2 Pro hurts, especially it happened only after a streak of success. But what is failure if not a more apparent source of dissatisfaction? Regardless, we know that there is no satisfaction. May it come from internal judgment or external objective events like a failure. There is only this queer divine dissatisfaction pushing us to think further, think deeper, and go further. More recently, I get distracted by comparison. I have many hats on, I have many projects, and most of them are relevant to my medical training. My experience comes directly from work, self-studying, online courses. I take pride in taking initiative, but when a Stanford graduate with a master's in computer science joins the team, I look at him awkwardly and I look at myself and I find myself thinking, do I deserve to be here? In those circumstances, I challenge myself to be as vulnerable as I can with the team. I make myself ask questions I used to find too dumb to ask and I make myself be as honest and open about what I'm good at and what I'm absolutely terrible at. It turns out 99% of the time, my colleagues who are experts in areas I find so distant also have their own uncertainties. And it might be in the areas that I am skilled in, like user experience or biochemistry I happen to still know from med school. We just don't voice our uncertainties out. It is known as pluralistic ignorance, where each of us doubts ourselves privately, but believe we're alone in doing so because none of us has said anything. The reality is we are all in the same boat together, each with our doubts and certainties. When we as a community openly discuss 
this dissatisfactions and celebrate progress instead of making unhelpful comparisons. Can you imagine how beautiful that can be? Instead of being discouraged and distressed by how far we still need to go to get better, I urge you to remember this beautiful origin that we all share. On one hand, we have this divine dissatisfaction that keeps us going, climbing further. On the other hand, we have this beautiful acceptance that even if we are far from great, far from perfect, there is still so, so much to celebrate. There we have it, blessed and rest, that keeps us marching and more alive than the others. Thank you.